Hey guys, Johnny from Ignite here. Thanks for tuning in to another video. Today we're gonna to be looking at an artist of the floating world and the formal elements, the form that shapes this novel. Before I do that, I do recommend checking out ignitehsc.com.au. That is Ignite's platform where we put all of our online, and our, these are our best resources, all of our online resources for the HSC English syllabus. They're all up there, standard, advanced, and the extension one course. Please check them out. They are invaluable in my opinion. We have, have crafted these very in-depth resources that take you start to finish through the syllabus. So please check that out if you are interested. And also, you know, I know you're craving to do this, please do subscribe to our video. We very much appreciate the subscriptions. Uh, they really do, you know, give us a good little motivation to make that extra video for you. So uh, like and subscribe if you enjoy or if you have been enjoying. Okay, so let's get into the video today, the form of an artist of the floating world. So the first thing to acknowledge is what is form and what are we talking about when we talk about the form of an artist of the floating world? Well by form we're talking about the broader compositional choices of the composer, in this case an author, Ishiguru, in actually making the text. So how are we consuming the text in this case? Well you're not seeing the text, strictly speaking, you're not, you're not watching the text, it's on a film, you are reading the text, it is a novel. So you start there, it is a novel, it is gonna be in the form of a book or an ebook or something like that, but we call it a novel and it is written in prose fiction. So it's not a non-fiction novel. Notice how we're working down the line of how specific we are here. The broadest thing is it's a novel. Second broadest thing is it's a prose fiction novel. And what is prose? Prose is like just free flowing sentences. It's just written how you would speak normally in day-to-day -day conversation. There is no particular structure to each line. There is no rhythm or meter to it as you might find in a poem or in you know, Shakespeare's plays. A lot of the upper class people speak in verse. Verse is the opposite. So we have prose fiction. What about the fiction side of this? Is it important that it's in fiction? Well, I think one comment I would make just to get you thinking in this area is that an artist of the floating world is largely about the absence of any objective truth. It explores a lot of things to do with the fallibility of memory, the tension between past and present, and the struggle to reconcile the two, things you have already done and how people see those actions now. We see that very much through Ono's story, the protagonist. And the fact that this is fiction is important because it means there is an element of imagination involved, there is an element of subjectivity involved. This is not a non-fiction, this is not fully based on true events, although of course the Second World War is the key event that features in it, which is an element of realism in the novel, which is important and it's an aspect of form. But more than that, we are looking at this time where the truth of what happened and the reality of one's responsibility for what they did in the past is not certain. Ono often struggles to remember things clearly and fiction itself does open the door for a broad scope of interpretation. So it must get you thinking now, what does that mean for what I'm reading? What do I believe? What is real? What is not real? Right? So we have this kind of fiction that is still has real events within it. We are questioning whether it is possible to obtain any objective truth about anything or does everything just depend on how the individual receives it subjectively? And in this novel, you'll arguably see that it is the latter. It is, everything is subjective. You can't have any objective truth. This is a very postmodern concept. Postmodern meaning after World War II when the certainty of everything was collapsed because we've had a second world war, we've had atomic bombs dropped on Japan. Japan is the country on which this novel is based. Ono, the protagonist, is Japanese painter, an artist. And what we see here is that all the meaning and certainty is lost because you have such a devastating event, everyone questions all the traditions, all the institutions, all the values that they've ever believed in. Everything they thought was, yes, this is the right way to think, this is the right way to feel about this, it all gets shattered. The shattering of that reality expands into every element of people's lives so they don't know what to believe, they don't know what's true. And that's the concept we see through this fictive form. Okay, so now we're looking at the fact that there is an unreliable narrator in this story. So the narrative is actually written from Ono's perspective, the protagonist. It's not written in third person. It's not some outside or external narrator who's telling the story. It's not someone who knows everything. It's actually written from Ono's perspective, how he sees things, which makes the whole narrative that we're reading inherently unreliable because 
Who knows if Ono is the best person to trust in terms of all the events that happened? Again, we're constantly being challenged to question the truth of what we are reading. We are being challenged in terms of everything we consume in the narrative. We could say, I don't know if that's right to believe. I don't know if that's the truth. And you would be right to thinking that because, and you would be right in thinking that because when you have first person narration, you are inevitably going to fall into a trap of bias and we are limited to Ono's subjective perception of things. It's very hard to get a more objective view of things when everything is told from one person's perspective. And again, this plays into that theme of the fallibility of memory, how people can be wrong, and that there is no objective truth or no way of finding an objective truth, that everything is shaped by the individual experience. And that makes it very hard to discern meaning and find truth in what people say, such as owner. So we'll be taking along that journey of trying to figure out what really happened. So there's an ambiguous you as well. You'll notice, as in this quote, if on a sunny day, you climbed the steep path leading up from the little wooden bridge, right? If on a sunny day, you climb, it seems like it's talking to you, the reader. It seems like he's actually engaging in a dialogue and this is the very opening of the narrative. Very opening of the novel, open it up, you'll see this and you'll feel like, oh, I'm actually being invited into the story. And sometimes composers do this. They really do want to tr target, they really do want to target the reader or the audience and they want to get you directly engaged. Now, you might think that at first, but if you know Ono well enough, and perhaps, or I think anyway, that by the end of reading, after you've read the novel, you actually change your mind in terms of what this means, and especially if you look at what Ishiguro himself, the writer, says about this, once you've read it all, you realize Ono really struggled to have a broad perspective on things. He, seen, he was very close-minded in a way, very stubborn in his views, because he didn't want to accept the reality that when he was an artist before the Second World War, he was, his art was used as propaganda to actually get Japanese soldiers to support the cause. And the cause was to expand Imperial Japan and, and the control and power they had. And of course that did fail at the end, but he was part of the devastation and destruction. So many people's lives taken during that event of the Second World War. We had the atomic bombs dropped on Japan at its close and Ono can't help but feel a little bit responsible perhaps, but he doesn't want to face that responsibility. But he's being told by future generations, the younger generations, the younger generations that make up the new Japan. After World War II, we have this new cultural zeitgeist, which is like a new spirit and it's a new social and political context. And it is about people saying to the older generation, you were responsible. Things you did contributed to the devastation that was World War II and you need to be responsible for it. But Ono, he's an older person. He's a little bit more stubborn. You might know your grandparents often a bit more stubborn, closed-minded. They've lived a bit longer. They have these entrenched views and he struggles, right, to actually open his mind and see beyond and see how his actions as a painter, even though they might have been innocent and intended for good things, were used by someone outside of his control, by something outside of his control for potentially evil purposes. And he has to be responsible for that. But he struggles the whole way through to actually take that perspective on. So he lives within this very parochial perspective, which is limited, narrow, rather than a broader perspective. So when he's saying, if on a sunny day, you, it seems that he could only be talking to some hypothetical other that embodies the same worldview as him rather than the reader. I don't think he can envisage the reader even being a person who would understand or that would, he would be talking to. He can only think that who he's talking to is someone who shares his same worldviews because he is embodied as being that stubborn and that stuck and ingrained in the pre-war way of thinking that actually proved so devastating. And it's going to be the challenge for him by the end of the novel to actually get out of that mindset and open his mind and be like, okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe what I did was contributing to an evil cause and I need to be responsible for that. So the fact we see that throughout the novel means that we probably are not being engaged directly as a reader, but he's talking to this hypothetical other. Now, the last point here is that we have a nonlinear narrative structure. We have flashbacks. We have persistent low modality. Let's talk about what that means. Nonlinear narrative structure means we're constantly going from past to present, past to present, past to present, switching, switching. He is struggling. Ono is struggling to reconcile the actions of his past with the now present. And the present Japan in which he lives is a society that actually condemns him and his generation for what they did in the war, for how they actually 
facilitated that destruction. So he's being condemned by the present, so he's kind of stuck in the past and he needs to try and move himself to the present. And that struggle to move is being embodied structurally by the non-linearity of the narrative. Hopefully you're following that. He's constantly going between past and present in his mind. He feels conflicted in terms of his identity and he needs to let go of his former self. And the fact he's struggling with that is being represented structurally by the non-linearity of the narrative. In terms of the persistent low modality, you can see as in this quote, of course, that is all a matter of many years ago now. And I cannot vouch that those were my exact words that morning. We can see from that quote that he is often uncertain as to what he's actually recounting to us. That means he has low modal expression. There is low modality. There is uncertainty. There is a low definitiveness in how he's speaking because he himself is questioning whether he remembers things the right way. And remember that postmodern concept that really is being explored in this novel is that you probably can't remember exactly what happened ever. You just have to adjust yourself to the present and appreciate that there are many different perspectives and that you may in fact have acted in a morally wrong way and he has to kind of accept that responsibility as we move forward. But he certainly does struggle and language like this does take the reader into this element of uncertainty, which is the very uncertainty that Ishiguru, the composer, wants to explore. Okay, so I hope this helps. Make sure you mention these formal elements in your essays. That's why we're doing these. We're trying to help you with how you articulate your analysis and we're trying to ensure that you don't confine yourself to very specific analysis that is embedded in tiny quotes. We want you to look at the composition as a whole. That's what a more sophisticated analysis will do. So make sure you use as many of these elements as you can and you'll definitely be on track for top marks in your essays and in your exams. So thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this. Please like the video and we will see you shortly for the next one. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. If you do like the content, subscribe to our channel and we'll have more videos coming your way. That's right guys, thanks for watching and please make sure you check out our online resource database. We've had a team of state rank achievers and heads of English put these together for you, covering everything from essay structures and examples all the way through to craft of writing and comprehension skills. So check them out at ignitehse.com.au and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.